Um, great. So uh, welcome, everyone. This is our webinar series, Health System Transformation, Speaking Up and Speaking Out. And today, the focus of this webinar is actually building on the uh, webinar that we had last month that was on decriminalization. And today we're expanding the conversation beyond decriminalization and focusing on harm reduction. A warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much for joining this conversation and participating uh, today. My name is Susan McNeil. I am a registered nurse and work with the implementation of best practice guidelines at RNAO. And I actually, I co-host this webinar series together with um, colleagues who are here with me today. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement and recognizing that our work and the work of uh, our members and, and those of you who are on the call today takes place on traditional indigenous territories across Ontario. We also wish to acknowledge that the Arneo head office is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 under the Toronto Purchase Agreement with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So this land today is still the home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this territory. By personally making a land acknowledgement, we're taking part in an act of reconciliation honoring the land and the heritage, uh, indigenous heritage, which dates back to more than 10,000 years. So we encourage you to learn about the land that you reside on, the treaties that are attached to it, because land acknowledgements are a small act of reconciliation and we must all do our part. And uh, the website there, nativeland.ca is one place where you can learn a little bit more about the land that you work and live on. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, we'll see how the conversation goes today. Uh, there is a great interest in people re-watching or sharing the recording with colleagues. Um, however, if there is sensitive content that comes up, we may um, edit the, the recording. And in, in one, one instance in the past, we just decided that we weren't going to um, share the recording publicly. So that is still a possibility, but we are recording today's session and we'll post it if appropriate. So uh, this is our agenda for today. Uh, in a moment, I'll be asking my colleague, Sabrina Morali, who is the manager of mental health and addiction uh, program at RNAO to provide us with um, a bit of background about some of the work that we do here at RNAO. And then Matthew Kelway, our director of nursing and health policy at RNAO is going to um, also add to Sabrina and talk about some of the work that we're doing in the policy department on harm reduction. Then we're going to focus, really, this is what we're mostly um, here for, is our panel discussion focusing on uh, harm reduction. And we have this wonderful panel who I will introduce um, is shortly after Sabrina and Matt speak. Um, we have Haley Thompson, Scott M. Ruth, uh, Mish Waraksa, uh, um, Dawit Belay, and Michael Roach. And uh, so, We'll have the panel discussion and then we'll open it up to questions, answers, dialogue, and Sabrina will moderate that discussion. And, um, and then we'll, we, we'll actually, we're talking about um, taking action a little bit earlier on and then we'll close the day. And Dr. Doris Grinspan will um, join us if she's able, but there are some other things that are happening right now as well. So this is the plan for today and just a warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us. So uh, over to you, Sabrina. Fantastic. Thank you, Susan. And welcome everyone to our exciting webinar today. Um, today's webinar will build upon our October 17th webinar, which talked about a multi-perspective on decriminalization of simple possession of drugs. The webinar can be watched and viewed on the recording that is on the slide. And I'll make sure once I finish talking to put it in the chat as well for you all. Next slide, please. So RNAO has a long history on supporting nurses with evidence-based practices in the area of substance use and harm reduction. 
When it comes to evidence-based practices, RNAO has multiple BPGs or best practice guidelines based on evidence that can support you in your clinical setting. Um, here are three specific guidelines. Uh, we started in 2015 with the Engaging Clients Who Use Substances Best Practice Guideline. And it talks about how can nurses in all care settings and, and, and the interprofessional team rather um, support, nurse, uh, support clients who use substances irrespective of care setting irrespective of urban or rural boundaries as well. Um, based on some policy action and some work that RNAO did have with Insight in 2018, we released the Implementing Supervised Injection Services Guideline, as well as a foundational principle guideline, the crisis intervention for using a trauma-informed approach is something that can also be employed as well. Next slide, please. So the mental health and addiction portfolio, which I have the great privilege of managing and supporting, um, it was established in 2006, really with the aim to provide support to nurses and healthcare providers across the care settings to enhance evidence-based care and services. And the way that we do that is we develop, we take the guidelines itself and actually develop them into resources that nurses can use, whether it's our workshops, our multiple e-learning series, our uh, monthly webinar series or um, interactive videos that we have on our webpage or toolkits, we invite you to take um, action and take a look at some of the resources and get involved and, and contact us and um, we'd love to have your support. Next slide, please. So recently launched in August 31st was our um, RNAO In Focus Mental Health and Addictions page. And what's really exciting about this page is it talks about what the organization as a whole, including members, are working on when it comes to mental health and addiction. So we invite you to take a look at the In Focus page, which you will find um, recent resolutions, interest groups and chapters that are interested in this area, some of the media releases we have, as well as some policy um, and best practice guidelines um, programs and supports we have. So I'll turn it over to Matt right now to take us through some policy, exciting work that we're doing. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Matthew Kelly, Director of uh, Policy for Public Policy for RNAO. Um, the clinical work um, that uh, Sabrina and her group uh, provide is uh, supported um, by our uh, public policy team and the, uh, both the policy development that we do as well as the advocacy that we do. You will know that uh, RNAO has three signature advocacy events throughout the year, Queens Park on the Road, Queens Park Day, and Take Your MPP to Work. Since 2019, the issue of harm reduction has been one of our priorities and has featured in uh, those signature advocacy uh, events. In addition to those, uh, we also have on occasion action alerts that we ask our members and the public to sign uh, to let uh, MPPs and or MPs uh, know about uh, our views on uh, harm reduction issues and, and to put forward our recommendations for them about legislative uh, changes uh, to be made to support harm reduction in the province of Ontario and across the country. Um, one of those advocacy events we, we recently conducted, it was called uh, Decriminalize Now, where we asked uh, candidates uh, for mayor in uh, about 20 municipalities across the province to um, pledge to put forward a motion in front of city council, should they get elected, to request um, exclusion under uh, the Canadian, um, um, the CDSA, uh, sorry, and um, and we will be following up uh, with advocacy on that as we um, end 2022 and head into 2023. Um, our advocacy, if you could put to the next slide, please, Olivia. Our advocacy takes us into um, direct um, meetings with MPPs and a little picture here of our recent meeting with the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, uh, Minister uh, Tobolo. Um, at his offices, you can see our CEO, as well as Sabrina and others uh, down there on the TV. Um, and we were uh, asking Minister Tobolo to uh, support our, um, our policy um, for um, greater funding and support for supervised uh, consumption services in Ontario. Um, for greater um, support for safer supply programs, uh, including um, necessary changes to the Ontario drug formulary, and for his support for decriminalization um, in Ontario as well. Um, next slide, please, Olivia. Uh, this is the top two graphs from the fact sheet that we use for our advocacy for Queen's Park on the Road, which is underway um, now. 
We've had about uh, 20 meetings with MPPs so far across the province. And um, this is really context for why we are running this series on harm reduction, uh, including our last one on decriminalization. You can see on the left side of your screen there, the average number of deaths per day in Ontario from opioid overdose. And by 2019, of course, we, we were alarmed by uh, the dramatic increases. And that's why um, uh, this issue of the opioid related uh, overdose crisis in Ontario rose to the top of our priority list. And of course, that uh, death rate from overdoses in Ontario has uh, increased by 85% through the course of the uh, COVID pandemic. It is not just, of course, uh, the deaths, but you, you'll see from the um, from the chart on the right hand side that there's been uh, an increase in hospitalizations and, and a dramatic increase in, um, in emergency room visits across the province um, due to um, opioid related overdoses. And so um, with that context, let me turn it back to you, Susan, for an introduction to our uh, panelists tonight, today, this afternoon. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Matt, and also Sabrina for uh, setting the stage and some background for this topic today. Um, so I would like to introduce our panel and then I'll stop sharing my screen. And I think Haley, you wanted to share some slides so you can be prepared to share your screen and mesh the same. Um, and uh, certainly slides are optional, but um, a couple of you wanted to share some information from your organization. So I'll just um, read out the bios and then uh, move on. Um, so Haley Thompson is the project manager at Toronto's Drug Checking Service at the Centre on Drug Policy Evaluation. She's responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the drug checking pilot, including fostering robust relationships with partners and working with the harm reduction community to optimize the service. Haley holds a Master of Health Science in Health Administration from the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Scott M. Roos has been a part of the social services industry since he was a child ready to be adopted. He says, we were working through the social lens of the education system in the 1980s where ADHD and Ritalin were the norm. We are just scratching the surface of today's use of rehab and harm reduction. We are learning that some things work better than others. Wading through the sea of options, Scott tries to embody these best practices until we know better. We can't do better unless we know better, he said. Uh, Mish Waraksa is a nurse practitioner and clinical lead of the Parkdale Queen West Safer Opioid Supply Program, a Health Canada funded program for people at high risk for harm from the toxic unregulated drug supply. Mish is a consultant for the National Safer Opioid Supply Program, a community of practice, providing support uh, to clinicians new to safer supply pro practice. Mish has a passion for creating transformative healthcare programs for people alienated by our healthcare system and strives to provide client-centered care for people who use drugs. Dewey Belay is a registered nurse with the Regent Park Community Health Center's Safer uh, Opioid Supply Program, or the SOS program. In addition to the SOS program, uh, Dewey has practiced as an RN in the Toronto Shelter System, Consumption Treatment Services, and the COVID Recovery Shelter Hotel. And Michael Roach is a registered nurse and the Northeastern Ontario Regional Lead for Addiction Services. In addition to providing regional leadership, he is also the manager for Sudbury's Rapid Access Addictions Medicine Clinic and the Outpatient Addiction and Gambling Service. He's an advocate for implementing innovative approaches to substance use treatment and enhancing harm reduction initiatives in the inpatient and outpatient hospital setting. So what a, a wonderful panel. I just want to thank you all so much um, for, for agreeing to spend uh, the time with us today. And uh, we'll start with um, Haley and Haley's just getting uh, her screen up and it's looking good, Haley. So over to you, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm so um, honored to be invited to participate in this panel, hearing everyone else who's speaking. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so building on 
uh, there we go, building on Susan's acknowledgements, um, I would like to acknowledge the members of our community uh, advisory board, our partner organizations, and those that have lost their lives, both in the ongoing drug poisoning crisis and long before due to unjust drug policies and policies of criminalization. Uh, we acknowledge the land in which we operate Toronto's drug checking service is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And lastly, we acknowledge that racialized communities and survivors of colonization are disproportionately uh, impacted by unjust drug policies. And we, uh, at the Centre on Drug Policy Evaluation, strive to support the development of equitable drug policy that are uh, responsive to the needs of racialized people who use drugs, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color and their communities. Um, so hopefully everybody has heard of Toronto's Drug Checking Service, but if you have not, um, we are a pilot program. Um, we received funding from uh, Health Canada's Substance Use and Addictions Program back in February of 2018. Um, we officially launched in October of 2019 and have been in our implementation phase since then. Uh, currently, our pilot is scheduled to wrap up at the end of January 2023, but we are actively seeking uh, funding to sustain this service beyond that. Um, we've also received some funding from the St. Michael's Hospital Foundation. We are embedded within St. Michael's Hospital. Um, and we were one of three uh, organizations that were uh, given money from SUAP's uh, programming for drug checking. The other two organizations were out in BC. So we were really the first uh, and only drug checking program in the province for a very long time. And we've recently learned that Thunder Bay um, has launched a service and many others are interested. Um, and we're here to uh, answer any questions people have about that at the end in terms of initiating a, a drug checking program. Uh, drug checking is currently part of a suite of harm reduction services available to those in downtown Toronto, including supervised consumption, um, safer opioid supply programs, naloxone distribution, uh, et cetera. And our program specifically is embedded within supervised consumption sites. Um, so what is it that we do specifically? Uh, we are a free and anonymous service that offers people who use drugs uh, detailed information on the contents of their drugs in order to help them make more informed or the most informed decisions about their drug use. So that's at an individual level. And then uh, every other week, we aggregate all of our data and put it up on our website. And we do this in an effort to share information on what we're finding in Toronto's unregulated drug supply in real time in order to help uh, harm reduction workers and clinicians be able to tailor the care they, provi they provide to people who use drugs and uh, what's in the unregulated supply in that moment. Um, we also share information uh, on our website every other week in an effort to inform policy researchers and the public writ large on what is we're finding in the service. And we also use that information to advocate for services and safer alternatives for people who use drugs. Um, I want to make it clear that what we do not do is make any type of judgment call about drug use. We do not condemn or condone the use of drugs. We do not classify a drug as good or bad that is found through our service. And we do not tell people what to do based uh, on the results of the analyses. Um, we are just here to provide people with the most information possible. Currently, the service is embedded within five supervised consumption sites in the downtown core. So as far east uh, as Seth Riverdale Community Health Center, keep six. Um, in the downtown core, uh, Toronto Public Health, the Works, and Moss Park offer drug checking. Um, and then as we head west, uh, the, both the Parkdale and Queen West sites of the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center offer drug checking. Um, TRIP is a youth-based harm reduction service that is embedded within Queen West that is also one of our partners. Um, there are two sites. Uh, analysis sites is what we refer to the clinical laboratories that analyze the samples that we collect. Um, one is KMH, the other one is St. Michael's Hospital, and we are coordinated by the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation, which is why we are up there. Uh, so what does it look like if somebody wants to use our service? Um, if somebody wishes to check either a substance, which could include uh, 10 milligrams of a powder, a crushed pill, liquid, blotter, um, they can, or, or used equipment, uh, most often used uh, filters or used quick cookers, they can make the decision, oops, to have that sample checked and bring it to one of the five collection sites. Uh, the collection site will collect, as I said, a small amount of their sample or their used equipment 
treatment and ask them a few questions, such as what is the expected drug you are checking? Is the sample associated with any adverse effects, um, texture, color, just some information that's helpful for us to understand why the person is using the service. Um, and as well, once we get the analysis results, if that information can be used to help educate uh, the public. Uh, once the sample is collected five days a week, Monday to Friday, samples are brought by uh, way of bike courier to one of the analysis sites where a sample is analyzed using either gas chromatography or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, in 24 to 48 hours. The results are then sent back to the site that collected the sample, who in turn shares those results with the service user, either in person by phone or by email, uh, along with tailored harm reduction information. So what this could look like is if somebody was checking a fentanyl sample and benzodiazepines were found, for example, um, information shared may be, you know, uh, maybe do a test dose, be sure to use with a friend. If you have uh, valuable belongings that you wish to lock up before you use in order to make sure that you don't have them on your person to be safe, um, those sort of things. Uh, so that is sort of at an individual level, but, uh, you know, once we aggregate all of the individual results, uh, what is it that we're seeing in the supply uh, since we launched in October uh, 2019? Since then, we've checked over 7,000, close to 7,500 samples. Approximately 50% of what we check are expected to be opioids. Specifically, 45% um, are expected to be fentanyl. And the other samples we check are made up of various stimulants, psychedelics, depressants, um, disassociatives, et cetera. Um, when somebody submits uh, a sample, we ask what that drug is expected to be. Um, and what that really means is what was this drug bought or got as? And uh, this really helps us with drug market monitoring. So as you can see uh, on your screen, the proportion of expected methamphetamine substances that we have checked since October 2019 until November 4th, so just uh, last week, um, over 80% of expected methamphetamine met service users' expectations and only contained methamphetamine. Cocaine, we're looking at over 65%, crack cocaine over 40%. But then when we get down to opioids, opioids uh, are overwhelmingly more contaminated than other uh, expected drugs. So for fentanyl, uh, only 5% of expected fentanyl samples met service users' expectation, meaning that it only contained fentanyl heroin and carfentanil, as you will see, uh, even less so. Uh, when fentanyl is present in an expected fentanyl substance, or any substance really, but uh, we are able to quantify it. So that means we're able to know exactly how much fentanyl is in that sample. And for clinical audiences, such as yourselves, we often uh, extrapolate that out to a dose or a, a point. Um, as well as a gram to help people understand what would be sort of a, a clinical equivalency. And we know that morphine equivalents are something that people are familiar with. So uh, based on an expected fentanyl sample, the median amount of fentanyl found being 4%. Uh, if we think about that in terms of morphine equivalencies, that's about 320 to 400 milligrams of morphine per dose or 3,200 to 4,000 milligrams of morphine per day. If we're assuming that the person using fentanyl is using a gram, which we have been told uh, is a fairly low assumed daily dose these days. Um, and also this, uh, our equivalency calculations assume that uh, fentanyl is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. And we're working with organizations like um, Medify and the National Community, uh, the National Safer Supply Community of Practice to, um, you know, understand or translate what this means for clinical practice and how we can ensure we're meeting the needs of people who use drugs um, based on the uh, safer supply medications that are being provided. So in my previous slide, I mentioned that only 5% of expected fentanyl substances met service users' expectations. Um, over 80% of the time, uh, fentanyl samples contain both fentanyl and other drugs. Um, the other drugs uh, that we see present in fentanyl most often are the following. Um, the, the drugs present varying degrees of harm to people who use drugs. So a drug like caffeine, we, we really don't know uh, its long-term effects on people uh, consuming as much as people do uh, through their use of fentanyl. 
Um, but, and we just know that it's a cheap bulking agent that is not uh, particularly well liked by people who use drugs, but um, we know that for other drugs, they do present more of a, of a risk uh, or increased potential risk of, of overdose or adverse effects. So um, currently the, the drugs that are purple uh, on the screen, these are other opioids. So these would be drugs that would add to that 4% uh, of fentanyl being found, like the, the potency of that fentanyl. We know that these drugs, when they present alongside fentanyl would add to the opioid equivalency potency. Uh, the drugs that are currently presenting on your screen in yellow, these are drugs uh, that are have sedative effects, um, benzodiazepines, xylazine, synthetic cannabinoids. Um, they would potentially increase the risk of overdose for somebody who is expectingly trying or who is using fentanyl. Um, so uh, yeah, all, all of these drugs, which you see make up most of the drugs found alongside uh, fentanyl and expected fentanyl samples, unfortunately present uh, health risks to people who use drugs. To date, or from all the slides I've shared, I've shared our data aggregated over time, but it's also important to look at uh, if you break down that data um, over time instead of, sorry, at aggregate. Um, I've chosen benzodiazepines because that's something people uh, know, are starting to know uh, more about and that is regularly now presenting in the media. So when the service first launched, um, approximately 34% of expected fentanyl samples contained benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. Um, over time, that has varied uh, at its highest point, uh, over 81% of the expected fentanyl samples we checked contained a benzodiazepine. That was in Q4 of 2020. Uh, there's been considerable vari variability since then. Um, currently, it is about for, uh, for sorry October and November, we've seen about 45% of expected fentanyl samples um, containing at least one benzodiazepine. And this is obviously, um, you know, really impactful to people who use drugs, specifically if you're expecting to use fentanyl and benzodiazepines present, and you may not even know um, that you are using benzodiazepines when your drug of choice or the drug you use is, is fentanyl. Um, so people could be experiencing uh, benzodiazepine withdrawals when the amount of benzos presenting in expected fentanyl samples drops to say 30%, like it did in Q3 of 2022. Um, and, and we've heard that in the community as well, people fearing, feeling irritable, people not understanding what they're experiencing um, when their expected drug or the drug they want to be using is fentanyl. Um, if we get even a little bit more granular uh, and we look at the specific benzodiazepines presenting um, in the fentanyl supply, that has also changed significantly since the service launch. So when we launched atizolam, uh, which is a benzodiazepine related drug, um, Atizolam, when we launched Atizolam, was the benzo that presented most often, followed by uh, fluoromazolam, um, or sorry, fluoralprazolam. Um, and since then, there have been about six other um, benzodiazepines that present in the expected fentanyl supply with some regularity. And most notably, we've recently seen a, a dramatic shift in terms of like a decrease of Atizolam and an increase in the presence of um, bromazolam, which is a drug that is said to be considerable or um, uh, com comparable to uh, Xanax or alprazolam, um, as well as a rise in flubromazepam. Um, so again, you know, that not only is there variability in benzos presenting in fentanyl, but also the type of benzos, and those can also change, um, you know, the outcomes of people's experiences when they're using fentanyl. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going through these quickly, but I'm assuming there's going to be a really robust uh, question and answer. So please, if I haven't uh, answered anything, get me then. Um, this is the last slide I'll share on, on specifically about uh, drug market monitoring data. Um, and it's really just to demonstrate the, the change in time of drugs that we've seen present in samples associated with overdose. So when the service first launched, um, fentanyl and atizolam were once the only two drugs that presented in samples associated with overdose. And over time, more and more drugs um, have been presented in samples associated with overdose till uh, the end of September 30th, you know, we see upwards of 10 drugs presenting with some regularity in samples associated with overdose. Most uh, are benzodiazepines, but some such as isotinitazine and protonitazine or um, carfentanil are, are also opioids in addition to fentanyl. 
Um, so to close, I just wanted to highlight some of the reasons that we feel why we feel drug checking is so imperative or so important um, in the context of the drug toxicity and opioid overdose crisis. 38% um, of service users uh, who uh, completed our surveys um, uh, indicated that they had never used harm reduction services before, meaning that they that drug checking could be seen as a gateway to harm reduction and other health services, which we see as a massive win uh, so that people understand the services that are available to them in their community and hopefully are uh, less reluctant to access them in the future should they want or need to. Um, we know that 34% of service users reported uh, are surveyed by Toronto's drug checking service reported in the intent to do something different after accessing services. So um, that could look like ensuring that they have naloxone handy, using it a supervised consent consumption site, doing a test dose, not using a loan, um, et cetera. Uh, Thirdly, we also, we, we monitor the unregulated supply, which I uh, have brought up a few times in terms of sharing information on the supply every other week. Um, uh, we also um, share sort of the unique compounds that we find uh, over time. Uh, and that is really important, not only for, for people who use drugs so that they have the most robust information available to them, but we know other organizations such as the Office of the Chief Coroner of Ontario and Life Labs use this data to um, inform the work that they do. Uh, we work uh, either with public health organizations or we uh, release our own alerts uh, to alert the public of dangerous drug market changes um, that, that we need or that we know people need to be aware of in real time. Um, we know that our results inform clinicians in care. Um, it helps clinicians and patients to better understand withdrawals, adverse effects, tolerances. Um, drug checking also provides evidence to help support uh, you know, more, more robust uh, services and safer alternatives for people who use drugs. We know that a key challenge identified in Canada's safer supply pilot programs uh, first report was just that some pharmaceutical alter alternatives are not meeting the needs of, of people who use uh, fentanyl and we think some of our data uh, can be used to help support sort of more robust service offerings in order to ensure that those services are meeting the needs of, of people on safer supply programs. Um, and lastly, uh, something that we feel is very, very important to the service is that drug checking empowers people who use drugs to advocate for themselves and to contribute to solutions that impact them. So 99% of service users uh, that were surveyed by Toronto's Drug Checking Service report finding the service useful. 84% say they plan to use the service again. Um, and 27% of uh, service users who report that they're going to do something uh, different once they receive drug checking results report going back to their seller um, and, and sharing the information of what was found in their drugs with their seller. And in a way we see this as a, you know, sort of grassroots regulation or pushing from the bottom up to see change uh, in the unregulated supply. Um, so lastly, uh, I just, the key takeaways are uh, that we want to leave you with is that at the root of the drug poisoning crisis is uh, contaminated, toxic, and unpredictable opioid supply, and that that is really what is killing people. Um, the drug supply changes so rapidly that it makes it incredibly difficult for people to use safely um, and for harm reduction services like drug checking to respond, let alone get ahead of these trends. Um, and lastly, people who use drugs need a variety of services and safer alternatives. Uh, uh, most notably, um, we need a regulated supply of all drugs. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Haley. Uh, what a wonderful way to uh, to start um, our webinar. Um, you you offered us um, an incredibly compelling case uh, for the service, and yet that stands in stark contrast to the availability of the service uh, for people who use the unregulated uh, supply of drugs. Um, and so I, I wanna introduce um, our next guest, uh, Scott uh, Roos. Um, and um, Scott's going to tell us about um, his experience with the unregulated supply that, that Haley um, described as toxic, contaminated, and I think most scarily unpredictable. Um, Scott, you come from uh, southwestern 
Ontario where this kind of service isn't available um, to you and others who use the unregulated supply of substances. Um, let me turn it over to you to, to talk about um, your experience uh, with that. Before I get into that, Matthew, I just wanted to say we do um, benefit from the drug checking service. We get the email blast that comes out once a month, and we take that information very seriously, and we pass it on to clinicians to translate for us because we don't know what, what's going on, uh, how mm -hmm. to translate that. But we also know we, we, can, we can see that as soon as that email comes out, two weeks later, we have a, a, a spike in overdoses. So there's, there's actual... Um, Real time, you're getting that real time data, but it's it's, it's and that, that's the only unfortunate part. But it gives us a, a, a chance to get ready. We've got to like get get the troops together, get everything ready. You know, we've got things coming down the pipeline. It's coming down the 401, so it's going to be here soon. So we, we give us it lets us tell our friends that uh um be prepared. like all the all the standard um harm reduction uh, statements. Don't use alone. Don't. Uh, do the test dose, all those types of things. So I just wanted to tell um, uh, Haley that um, it is it is felt in the rest of Ontario, and I'm assuming that it's being felt across um, across the country as well. Thank you for the service. So actually, this is it's quite heavy, that this, this information that we've been taking. Can we take it just a moment to, to take a big deep breath in? So everybody just big, big, big deep breath. <sighs> Thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, harm reduction, um, you, hear, you hear it as a buzzword that's, that's been happening um, in, in, in um, pop culture and things like that. And, and things, that's, what, what are people saying about it today? So there's um, someone who's quite famous and quite um, uh, polarizing uh, that said, we all need to get on board here are ingrained stigmas around drugs and the people who use drugs run really deep. And if we actually wanna maximize, minimize deaths and keep people safe, the facts point in a very clear direction. We need to meet people where they're at, help them with transition to the safe drug use to stay alive, to remove barriers to, for those seeking addiction treatment. And what we absolutely, absolutely need to stop doing is spreading misinformation and warehousing drug users in prisons. Or to say more succinctly, it's well past time to start paying attention to the man behind the curtain. That was John Oliver, the, the, the uh, late night personality, which I, I thought was really poignant because I was just like, you don't hear that from uh, late night. And the late night's not about anything serious sometimes. And I was really happy to hear that. Um, another quote that, that, that really set well with me was harm reduction in itself places paramount importance on the sacredness of life. And that was, um, uh, Landon Hillebrand, the Director of Housing and Clinical Development at the Mustard Seed in, in Edmonton. So what is harm reduction? What does it mean? So if we want to just get down to the, the basic meanings of harm reduction, it's the practice of reducing harms associated with drug use. It's an evidence-based approach to the, the complex issue of drug use. And it's not enabling the person who uses drugs. I want to say that again. It is not enabling the person who is using drugs. Um, it, it, it starts well after the point that they've decided that they're, they're going to use drugs. Now, this is harm reduction. It comes way downstream. And it, it's usually in response to a trauma. You know, trauma uh, uh, a relived, uh, that's been relived and unresolved, and, 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 and we don't have the mechanisms to cope with it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's been a radical approach because we will do our best to um, reduce the impact of harm that can occur in substance use. And by giving them the tools that in, uh, to ingest the subject, you, you know, it's, it's, it makes it easier for everyone involved. You know, it's, 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 like, it's like wearing a seatbelt. That's harm reduction. It's like going to a bar. A bar is a safe regulated supply. So you look at some things like that and you, you really have to uh, um, look at some of those things. So the principles of harm reduction are people that use drugs to uh, are not their addiction. Sorry about that. And the people who use drugs are not their addiction. They, de they deserve to be treated equal, equitably and humanely. And people who use drugs often have been subject to a 50 year 
drug war based on discrimination, stigma, misinformation, and many other things. Harm reduction is a philosophy of care in a way that service providers should be providing. Supervised consumption sites and, and, and uh, overdose prevention sites, needle exchange, NAT and oat therapy, RAM clinics, and mobile outreach are a very, very small percentage of what harm reduction means. It's a philosophy of care. The fundamental idea of harm reduction is that drug use is something that's part of society. We all seek dopamine. We're all dopamine seekers. Some of us have healthier options available than others. Some people choose to go to a bar to relax or they choose to go to a, uh, uh, they have other opportunities to make healthier choices. So what's in the toolkit? What, what do we have available to us that um, harm reduction is, uh, is for, at the forefront? So the one that's been around the longest is the needle exchange program. And that's been in, in 1983, a Yale student and a former heroin user um, began publicly distributing sterile needles to intravenous, sorry, intravenous drug users in New Hampton, uh, Connecticut. Now it's in 90 countries worldwide. Needle exchanges became the forefront of basic harm reduction policies. Needle and syringe programs, also known as needle exchange programs, is a social service that allows injecting drug users to obtain new and unused hypodermic needles and associated peripherals at little or no cost. Everyone, I believe everyone at the table today is very familiar with the needle exchange program. Then the next one that I think is, is, is uh, we need to make sure that it has, goes across the world, uh, across the country, is a supervised consumption site or overdose prevention site. It, these uh, save lives. It, it, it is, it's not rocket science. When you take something and bring someone to, together where they are supervised to make sure that they do everything properly, they, um, they, they, they don't overdose, they don't overdose. Like there's people that have saved them if they do. So it, it's, it's that community of care, it's that wraparound service, and it's that um, I see you kind of program that we need more of, we need more of. Medically assisted treatment or medication assisted treatment or MAT. So that's is, uh, your Suboxone and your uh, uh, Methadone. There's a couple other ones that I can't pronounce them and I don't even try. So uh, this includes the pharmaceutical intervention of, of, of getting people off drugs. It's a part of a larger, more comprehension addiction management plan. It involves the use of medication approved by Health Canada in combination with education, psychological counseling, behavioral therapies, and peer support to do that evidence-based approach to care. Ooh. The, the next one, which we, we just received in our community right, right recently, is we, we, uh, we started a RAM clinic, which is a rapid access to addiction medicine clinic. And these are where there's low barriers for people to make sure that they can get into, get the help they need. It's usually the first uh, point of access for some people who use drugs. And it's, um, they don't need a formal referral. So it's, it's that, that step away from the medical profession that they can, okay, I can just go in here and talk to somebody. I don't have to make an appointment and I don't do anything because I can't make appointments. Appointments and I don't mix. So, uh, and, and then the final one, which is a lot of people are quite familiar with is mobile outreach service. And mobile outreach service is one of those I was, I'm proud to be a part of. And it's, uh, it's, you just, you go out, you can meet people exactly where they're at on the street, in the, in the, in the alleys, in the, in the apartment buildings, living rough, couch surfing, you meet them where they are. You say, hey, I hear you. I see you. You're a person. So what needs to happen now? First thing, the, the easiest and most effective way of dealing with some harm reduction and helping uh, people who use drugs is your words. Your words carry so much weight and so much power that um, when you take the time to think about what you're going to say next and really take that, uh, that step to say, this is a person. This is not a person who's, this is not a drug that's talking to me. This is not a, 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 a diagnosis that's talking to me. It's a person.
And I think that's, that's one of those things that I say every time I do a, a conversation with everyone. Your words have meaning and agency and they can do magic and they can do harm. Um, the, the next thing is we have to accept as a society, as a, a, a human race, that drugs are a part of our society, that we are dopamine seekers, that we uh, have healthy ways of getting that dopamine, and there are unhealthy ways of having that dopamine. We need to make sure that that unhealthy way of, of using the dopamine is lessened. It's, it's reduced harm reduction. So, what, I don't know if, if um, a lot of everyone would uh, know the percentage wise, but out of all the people who use drugs, what do you think is the percentage of people who have, who have a problematic substance use disorder? Just do it in the chat. If, I'm going to pop it up here. I'm going to call people out because I know people in the, in the audience. <laughs> 5%? No, it's it's a little higher than that. 30%? We're looking, you're close. So it's it's um 20 to 40%. And it was a study done by Anthony and Al. Um, uh, I don't have the year. I have to get that year so I can make sure that this is credible. But a lot of people are thinking, are, are thinking that everyone that touches drugs, they're, they're gonna be addicted. No, they're not. There's people that have a that can be a functioning uh, person who uses drugs and they use this as their coping mechanism and it is not causing harm. So therefore they're not addicted. And these, um, we forget about some of those, uh, that section of the, the, the people who use drugs community. And we really, and I think that's one of those things that harm reduction is also available to them. Does anyone have any questions? We're going to have a Q and A, Scott, after uh, yep. the panel gets a, a chance to to speak. Um, so be Excellent. be ready for that. Or I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> are, are are we ready to move on to the next panelist, Scott? We are. I'm fit. That's okay. a, that's it for me. Yeah. No. And thank you so much. It was it was such a wonderful uh, overview and and simplification, really, of of. Um, uh, what's available under that that umbrella that we use uh, uh, called harm reduction, um, and I I was struck um, by a couple of things you said um, that that harm reduction you were quoting somebody uh, harm reduction places paramount importance on the sacredness of life, and and that's something so um, deeply embedded in in uh, nursing uh, philosophy and practice I think. And yet that's also uh, kind of contrasted with um, the sense that it's such a, a radical uh, approach. And for someone who um, does uh, advocacy on, on this issue, it's kind of reconciling those, those two things that become so difficult. Why is something that puts paramount importance on the sacredness of life deemed so radical by, by those who are, are sitting in the seats of our legislatures? Um, anyway, it's, it, it was very interesting and, and thank you so much. And I want to now turn to um, start um, the, the uh, nurses off on our panel uh, with Mish, um, who's back um, by demand. Um, Mish, thanks for joining us again. Um, we pulled you in two weeks ago to, uh, to talk about decriminalization and its, its relationship to your uh, safer supply practice, and um, we really appreciate you coming back um, this time to to talk about um, safer supply uh, itself. So, so uh, let me let you go and and um, talk about uh, your practice and and um, safer supply. Thanks, Mish. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about safer opioid supply. Um, just a little bit about me. My name is Mish. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm also clinical lead uh, with the Parkdale Queen West Safer Opioid Supply Program in downtown Toronto. Um, and I have been a safer opioid supply prescriber for the last two and a half years. Um, so we'll talk about safe supply today. I think it's been mentioned um, a sprinkling here and there. Um, I was lucky to 
be able to listen to a talk this weekend by Garth Mullins, who's an excellent host of a podcast called Crackdown that I highly recommend for anyone interested in harm reduction. And what he said was, when I snap open a naloxone vial, I hear the sound of a failure upstream. And I thought this was so poignant um, that by the time someone is actually overdosing, we've missed the opportunity to employ so many other interventions to stop harm. Um, and one of those is safe supply. Um, and with this mass failure of, of public policy and with mass deaths, we need to be employing every kind of intervention that we have, um, whether that be more on the realm of treatment and prevention or over to harm reduction and things like safe supply. Um, so safer supply is a concept that came out of the community of people who use drugs. Um, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs put out a concept document in 2019 um, stating that safe supply refers to a legal and regulated supply of drugs with mind and body altering properties that traditionally have been accessible only through the illicit drug market. So the intention of safe supply is to provide people who use drugs with a safer alternative, something that's regulated and of known strength. Um, and quality. This can be done in a number of models, um, and today I'm going to talk more about medicalized safe supply, which is what we do with our program, the goals of which are to reduce the risk of overdose and overdose death by providing adults exposed to the contaminated illicit drug supply with low barrier access to a safer drug supply, also to reduce harms associated with illegal activities required to access drugs through the street market. So sometimes people may be engaging in survival sex work, which they might not be doing otherwise, um, or other activities like shoplifting, et cetera, in order to be able to obtain the substances that they need. Um, with our programs, we also want to increase access to healthcare, harm reduction services, and other social services for people who use drugs. The guiding principles of safe supply programs, uh, first and foremost, to be harm reduction focused. Safe supply is not intended to be an addiction treatment. It's not supposed to be ending people's um, dependence on opioids, but to provide a safer supply and reduce the harms associated. Our programs should be patient determined, um, patient determined and directed outcomes, which means that some of our clients uh, don't intend to completely stop their use of, use of fentanyl. They may have goals to simply reduce their use um, or to reduce their risk of overdose otherwise. Um, so we don't uh, require that our clients are abstinent of, safe, of the street supply in order to continue with the program. Um, the voices of people who use drugs are prioritized um, at every level with program planning and implementation as well as evaluation to provide low barrier care and assertive engagement and creative persistence uh, to try and really meet people where they're at and get people to continue with care with us and to provide anti-oppressive medical care, especially in the context of a lot of stigma and discrimination for people who use drugs in our current system. So what does safer opiate supply actually look like day to day? Um, usually people are being prescribed a long acting opioid as part of their uh, safe supply. So we're often using slow release oral morphine or cadian. So that's a 24 hour formulation of morphine. And for some folks, we do have methadone as their, um, sometimes called the backbone to their safe supply. I've also included a few of the options here that we unfortunately don't have available to us in Ontario. Um, we do have fentanyl patches that are used in BC for safe supply, um, but in Ontario, they're only available to 50 micrograms per hour. Um, and if we have people on the fentanyl patch here, they kind of end up sort of looking like a sticker book. We have 10 patches on them. Um, it's not really sustainable. And the purpose of having the long acting opioid as part of this is to help people with, with withdrawal management um, so that people don't have to be waking up in the middle of the night uh, to use either the street supply or their Dilaudid. And then also providing overdose protection because people have a baseline anticipatable tolerance if they're getting something daily. Um, for the more safe supply portion, we do have a short acting opioid. So the intention of this is that our patients are able to get a euphoric effect um, similar to that that they're getting from the street supply. Otherwise, people also take their short acting opioid sort of on a as needed basis to manage withdrawal and cravings, even if they're not achieving a euphoric effect every time. 
So in Ontario, we're primarily using hydromorphone eight milligram tablets, uh, and our patients can choose to use them in whatever form they wish, whether that's injecting them, taking them orally, snorting them, um, they get them dispensed and they can use them as they wish. Um, I will highlight from uh, Haley's presentation that some of these medications are just quite weak in comparison to the street supply. So Haley was saying that one point of fentanyl might be equivalent to about 400 milligrams of morphine and a tablet of hydromorphone is equal to about 40 milligrams of morphine. So like one tenth the strength. So um, for people who are using upwards of a gram a day, sometimes it's difficult for them to be able to achieve a euphoric effect and have a true safe alternative to the street supply with what we have available in Ontario. Some of the other options that we wish we could have here and that are available in some provinces are high dose injectable hydromorphone, um, which would be ideal because it's a sterile liquid um, that's intended to be used in, by injection. And here it's not ideal. We're providing tablets that are intended for oral use um, and our clients are using them in different forms, um, which we understand to be safer potentially than using a unregulated supply, but it's not the safest thing that we have available to provide to clients. Um, but we just don't have the support on the Ontario drug formulary to provide this. Um, other formulations, diacetylmorphine, uh, which is heroin, which has been used in Europe um, for over 40 years for heroin-assisted treatment and has a, a plethora of evidence for its use. In BC, they also have access to Fentora tabs, so a sublingual form of fentanyl, and to sufentanyl, which is similar to fentanyl, but can be used IV, IM, or sublingual. And now we're seeing also programs in BC that are offering powdered fentanyl that's compounded by a pharmacy. Um, and the great thing about this also is that people are able to smoke it. Um, and currently we don't have a great option for people who are smoking fentanyl from the street supply um, for them to be replacing it. So this is what it looks like for patients within our program. They are attending the pharmacy daily, most, most of the time, and they're receiving uh, their Cadian or their methadone at the pharmacy observed by the pharmacist, and then are picking up Dilaudid tablets to take home and use as they wish. Um, and we're using up to about 30 tablets per day with our clients, depending on their needs. With our program, we're lucky to be able to also provide some wraparound services. Uh, so we do provide case management and health navigation for people to receive social supports, um, seek, seeking help with housing, replacing IDs. We do provide low barrier counseling. So we have a counselor that provides uh, services both on site at our clinic and with our mobile team. Um, and sometimes meeting people out in the community, having just a walk and talk form of therapy. We provide primary care to our patients, um, including preventative care, chronic disease management, and things like hep C and HIV treatment, as well because we are associated with a supervised consumption site uh, here, as well as a needle exchange, our patients do have access to other harm reduction services beyond safe supply. Across Canada, um, this came from a study actually that looked uh, at safer supply programs up until May 1st, 2020. So this is actually quite outdated. I just want to highlight that safe supply is not a small thing happening at a few clinics in Toronto. This is something that's happening across the country. Um, we did see an explosion of these safe supply programs, especially during the pandemic. But even here two and a half years ago, we have over 81 safe supply programs across Canada. Health Canada's Substance Use and Addictions Program, which funds our program, is currently funding 18 safe supply programs, or actually at the time of this study, so there's been more since. Um, but unfortunately, this is just pilot program funding. It's time limited to less than 60 months or five years total. And then there's questions around why we're getting this funding from a federal source when our healthcare funding falls under a provincial level, um, but we're not seeing these programs funded on a provincial level. Just to touch on the nursing aspects of our care, the majority of safe supply programs in Ontario are NP led, I'm very proud to say. Um, so it's NPs who are providing both the safe supply prescriptions and primary care to people who use drugs. And we are utilizing our RNs to a broad scope of practice in order to maximize our care, um, including independent assessment and follow up of clients, uh, health promotion activities, and harm reduction services as delivered by RNs. Some of the outcomes we see from our programs. 
Um, this study came out earlier this year, a comparison of people who were enrolled in Safe Supply versus a matched group of people in London, Ontario. Um, and London's had a Safe Supply program since 2016. So among their Safe Supply clients, they did see a significant decline in hospital admissions, emergency room visits, and hospitalizations for infections and a big decrease in non-primary care associated healthcare costs from 15,000 uh, to 7,000 per person. And they highlight the non-primary care related because the costs related to primary care because people were actually accessing healthcare um, in ways that they hadn't previously. Most of them weren't in touch with a family doctor. And a lot of those costs are actually associated with new hep C treatment uh, once people entered the program. So the cost of medications did increase. They also saw no increase in infections, overdose related deaths or all all cause mortality amongst uh, safe supply clients. So this was also reassuring of the safety of the programs. Other outcomes seen in their external evaluation with the London program, and, and we're having these evaluations uh, going on for our program currently, um, a decrease in the use of unregulated opioids. So 91% of their clients starting safe supply, um, that decreased to 46% of their current clients. And then at the outset, um, we can see how there's a little bit of a difference between people who are smoking and people who are injecting, again, reflecting that we don't have a, a great option for people who are smoking fentanyl and giving them a safe supply option. In terms of overdose reduction, 59% um, of their clients at outset had overdose in the past six months, and among current clients, only 23%. This was a quote that came from another study of a BC program. I've actually managed to eat like entire meals, you know, and so even those little, little things are kind of gifts of a program. If I did not have access to medications that day, I would have been out hustling or boosting or bullshitting for the dope. Oops. Um, bullshitting for the dope. So you never get time to eat. So we often are looking at these like really clear uh, quantitative medical outcomes of these programs, but not thinking also about the quality of life changes that happens for our clients. Um, people who, you know, have spent the last maybe 10 years waking up, feeling sick, um, trying to figure out how they're going to get the resources in order to purchase substances, using the substance, and then, you know, the next day waking up the same. Um, we have a lot of people reporting that there's just space in their life finally, to be able to do other things like finding employment, finding housing, reconnecting with family. And this is also a very reassuring statistic. Um, this comes from the Ontario coroner's office um, for what kind of opioids were associated with overdose. And here we can see that during the pandemic period, despite a large increase in the prescribing of immediate release hydromorphone with the safe supply programs, we actually saw both the absolute and percentage of uh, overdoses associated with hydromorphone drop by half during this time. So there's a lot of criticism of these programs and what might happen with increased prescribing um, because of previous associations with over prescribing of opioids. But during this time frame, we actually see a decrease in uh, overdoses related to hydromorphone use. <clears throat> so the future of SOS, um, hopefully permanent funding for safe supply programs, um, because we are time limited, it's also difficult to know what's going to happen with our patients, what happens if these programs end, um, broader safe supply prescribing. I always like to emphasize that, you know, we think we have a great program here and we do have these wraparound supports, but safe supply prescribing can be happening in all sorts of different settings. It can help people remain in hospital if they're uh, hospitalized for acute illness. Um, many times people are leaving because they are experiencing withdrawal. Um, and then expanding medication options so that we have something that is actually comparable to the street supply and is meeting the needs of people who use drugs. Beyond that, um, like I talked today, this is a medicalized model and it's very resource intensive and we're only able to reach a smaller number of clients. Um, so others have suggested more public health approaches to safe supply and demedicalized models of accessing a regulated drug supply. You know, you and I might go to the LCBO to, to access our safe supply of alcohol. Um, for a lot of people, they may not need medical monitoring in order to use something safely. 
And I definitely recommend that people check out the um, Drug User Liberation Front in located in Vancouver, who has been doing demonstrations of how uh, demedicalized models of safe supply could operate and providing a safe supply to people in the public through uh, giving away cocaine and heroin. Uh, so thank you very much for, for listening to me today and I look forward to questions. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Mish. I, I took note, of course, of what's uh, missing from the Ontario uh, drug formulary as per our uh, previous conversation. Um, let me um, m move it on to uh, Dewey, um, uh please. Uh, Dewey, is your camera operating or not yet? My camera is not working. Um, okay. Yeah. You've got a great radio oh, yeah, voice uh, anyway, so... Um, yeah. We look forward to to listening uh, to you. Um, Dweet is um, an RN um, with experience in in various uh, settings, experience with harm reduction programming in various settings, and and um, we're looking forward to uh, Dweet talking to us about his experience, mostly uh, with supervised consumption, um, connecting it back to um, Haley's uh, talk uh, about. Uh, drug checking in, in uh, the context of supervised consumption uh, sites. So do we, let me, let me um, leave it over to you, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm gonna focus on what CTS is and uh, what the role of nurses are in the CTS. So I'll, I'm gonna share my screen. If you allow me. So like I said, uh, my name is David. Uh, I've been a nurse uh, since 2005. I used to work in, in the shelter system between 2005 and 2018. And 2018, I've been working at a region park as uh, a conception treatment service site. And also uh, used to work in COVID recovery hotel between 2020, 2021. And I've been working as RN in SOS program at Trichon Park currently. So like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, CTS, uh, Conception Treatment Services, like uh, what CTS is. Uh, CTS in, at Trichon Park is embedded uh, within the system. Uh, in general, CTS is like, like a subsystem, uh, like you have pre-injection injection, uh, during injection, and of course injection. So um, any uh, person who is um, a drug user or substance user can access the sites. And um, CTS basically provides safe space for clients who injects a uh, drug of their choice. And CTS is safe, uh, it's non-judgmental, low barrier, and also trauma-informed. So um, from my experience working in a shelter system, as well as here at Region Park, in the past, uh, people used to inject in the washroom uh, or alleyways or streets. So people experience, a lot of people, I mean, people who is substance, as you know, as people mentioned from the previous panel, police harassment and incarceration was common. So the role of nurses in the CTS is uh, we do a lot of assessment of clients' needs while navigating the system, and also a lot of advocacy, uh, connecting clients to resources, uh, such as to primary care providers, uh, MDs, MPs, uh, the most common issue we see is skin and wound uh, care and also address overall physical health, mental health and immunization and connect them, connect them to social workers and case workers for if they need ID replacement or if they have housing issues, shelter beds or legal issues. 
and also shower and laundry. And also the, the other aspect of the nurses' roles is responding to overdose uh, situations, um, building therapeutic relationship with clients, educate clients how to find veins and inject safely, prevent infection and harm associated with injected substances. So for example, um, I used to collect data while I was in CDS between 2020, 2019 and December 2021, we see this. Can you see my share, my screen? Can you see the graph? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah. thank you. So, so, for example, in October 2019, we used to see 25 overdose. We, we responded to 25 overdose here at Region Park. Uh, in November 2019, we responded to 22 overdoses. So this is a monthly data I pulled for just for the sake of presentation. So as uh, when when the uh, World Health Organization declared pandemic in March 2020, the number of overdoses actually decreases. This is because actually because uh, the number of visitors decreases. So as you can see in May between March and October, there's a decrease in number of uh, overdose. This is related to access uh, because of the lockdown and the pandemic. So as the pandemic case decreases, the number of overdose increases because access to the service people who comes to the CTS to use the inject. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's in general. Uh, SOS is like, uh, like uh, Mish mentioned, SOS saves lives and it provides uh, to clients in a pharmaceutical drugs instead of contaminated street drugs and allows clients to spend less because a lot of clients spend money, you know, the average, uh, I mean, the average people spend who are users like at least I would say 200 to 500 a day. So having this safer supply decreases their expenditure and they can spend their, their the money to other aspect of their life. For example, clothing, housing, and other aspect of their life. And also SOS provide access to primary care, social worker, case workers. So one and the barriers are one of the barriers are like accessing primary care at a given time and missing appointment uh, screening, especially related to COVID and opening hours. Usually Region Park opens between nine and four and it's not opening on over the weekends. So that become a barrier. And also the limited amount of food available at Region Park. And the other barrier would be program capacity. For example, SOS, we have a lot of waiting lists, people who are waiting to, I mean, to come to the program. Because of the program capacity, we have limited uh, uh, number of people can actually access the program. Thank you, my presentation is very short, thank you. Well, that's that's wonderful, Dewitt. Uh, thank you very much. You gave us a great overview of what's happening in there, um, and much appreciated given your extensive experience uh, in harm reduction programs. Um, let me move over to um, to Michael. Uh, then Michael um, is the regional lead in uh, northeastern Ontario for addiction services. Uh, also, the manager at the Ram Clinic uh, in Sudbury. And um, today, or so far this afternoon, we've been talking about harm reduction programs um, in, in specific and, and separate uh, settings. And um, uh, Michael is an advocate for moving uh, harm reduction and integrating it into other health settings uh, and specifically hospitals. So um, Michael, if you could tell us a bit about your advocacy and your work, please. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am also going to share my screen here. 
if that's okay. Great. I'm so used to Microsoft Teams now, every time I have to use um, Zoom, it like totally threw, throws me off. Hold on for me for one second. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see my PowerPoint slide? I'm going yes. to assume so. Yes, it's there, thank you. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me here to speak today. Uh, about the harm reduction work that um, we've been doing at Health Sciences North up in Sudbury. Um, Health Sciences North is a acute care hospital uh, in Northern Ontario, uh, specifically Sudbury. Uh, we are we have both inpatient and outpatient settings, uh, and I kind of work a little bit in both. Um, my name is Michael Roach. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the regional lead uh, for the addictions program in the Northeast. Um, I specifically have a focus in helping roll out uh, rapid access addictions medicine clinics uh, throughout the Northeast, um, which ranges from Perry Sound um, all the way up to the James Bay Coast, across to uh, Sault Ste. Marie area, and then over to the Temiskaming area. Uh, so a wide geographic range where we're trying to get addiction services rolled out. Um, I've been in this role since 2019, and I can say uh, that in the three years I've been in it, uh, I have seen real uh, systems transformation throughout HSN as an organization um, in our approach to harm reduction, and am extremely happy in the work that I've uh, been able to be a part of. So before I talk about what we've been doing as an organization, I think it's really important to highlight uh, what's been going on in our region. Um, so Northern Ontario makes up about 88% of the landmass of Ontario, and we have about 6% of the population. So a lot of the stats I'm going to be presenting is related to uh, per capita data or per 100,000 population. So Ontario um, as a whole has been facing an unprecedented substance use crisis uh, that is continuing to escalate each year. Although the crisis is impacting everywhere, Northern Ontario is experiencing extreme numbers of death, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations that have only gotten worse throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, um, the Greater Sudbury Public Health Region had more than triple the Ontario rate of opioid-related deaths per 100,000 uh, people. Uh, it came down slightly in 2021, uh, but we still remain double uh, the uh, death rate uh, when compared to the rest of the province. Um, with 100 people dying in our community last year alone, we had the highest rate of death per 100,000 people in 2020, and we ranked third in 2021. We are seeing significantly high rates of admissions to our emergency departments, our inpatient medical units, our inpatient psychiatric units, and our outpatient programs have been extremely busy. Um, our district, also has very high rates of uh, alcohol use. I think we have a 26.5% uh, of the population admitting to using more than the recommended safe, uh, safe guidelines. Uh, and we've been seeing more poly substance use, more stimulant use, uh, and more cannabis presentations within our hospital. Um, although these trends escalated during the pandemic, they were also very high prior to 2019. Uh, because of this, our hospital started to invest resources into new programming uh, with a particular focus on our inpatient environments. So new treatment initiatives included the implementation of our addictions medicine consult service, uh, which is a specialist team that supports uh, people and uh, staff members within the hospital. Uh, we operate now an addictions medicine unit that opened in 2021, which is a area that specializes in supporting individuals uh, with substance use concerns while they are staying in the hospital. Um, we also have uh, investments in our RAM, so we now have a nurse practitioner, uh, and our outpatient addictions and gambling services also starting to grow. Uh, so in an effort to meet our clients where they are at while working with them, uh, in the hospital setting, we recognize as an organization that our clients are individuals who may or may not uh, want to stop using substances. And because of this, uh, and because everyone is unique, uh, we have been increasing our efforts uh, to improve our harm reduction approach throughout our hospital. So 
a lot of the initiatives that I just mentioned really stem back uh, to our 2019 to 2024 strategic plan. Um, HSN integrated our new strategic a plan with a, a several key goals, but one of those key goals is to be socially accountable uh, to the patients and the clients that we serve. Um, within that goal, uh, we have outcome 11, uh, which is up here on the slide. I'm not going to read it out to you. I'm going to paraphrase it. And basically what it means is that HSN is committed to improving access to substance use treatment and provide access to evidence-based treatment for substance use, regardless of where the person presents, uh, whether they're in our emergency department, on an inpatient bed, or in our outpatient program, they will be approached with evidence-based care, uh, which includes harm reduction and and uh, reduce stigma throughout the organization. Now, a strategic plan is one part of it, uh, and many of our new programs and existing uh, substance use treatment programs uh, have either been created on or adapted to meet a harm reduction model. Uh, however, uh, changing an entire uh, organization really requires an organizational approach. Um, so that's what led to our harm reduction philosophy. Uh, in 2021, HSN adopted a harm reduction philosophy, really focusing on um, approaching client care in a way uh, that reduces stigma and meets people where they're at. Um, so again, recognizing that substance use does not stop when people enter the hospital, the harm reduction philosophy is designed to shift the culture within our organization um, and change the way that we approach care for our patients. Uh, it ensures staff and physicians uh, have the required training uh, and education to support patients with substance use concerns uh, while they're in the hospital or receiving treatment in any of our outpatient settings. Uh, it has led to hospital-wide uh, needs assessment uh, to gain insight and feedback into the issues from staff, patients, their loved ones, and students. Um, and from there, we have implemented several uh, harm reduction initiatives throughout our hospital. So what does this mean for frontline staff uh, and, uh, and those who are actually treating clients? Well, uh, we really have uh, four key areas that we've been focusing on to start uh, while we're rolling out a lot of these harm reduction initiatives. Uh, first, um, we have a wide range of education on substance use, harm reduction, and stigma available to our staff um, through either in-person education sessions or self-learning packages uh, online. Um, we're currently working on enhancing this to include the use of uh, simulation uh, and experience-based learning. Uh, our education lead uh, actually provides lots of opportunities for frontline staff to discuss uh, any challenges that they are uh, facing in regards to implementing some of our harm reduction initiatives uh, and really challenge uh, our biases uh, and our stigma as, uh, as staff members. Um, we have consultative support experts uh, available to our staff uh, that are only a phone call away, um, and that is our addictions medicine consult service, uh, who are able to go and speak directly to staff to help them um, understand or approach uh, harm reduction uh, and substance use treatment uh, in ways that are client-centered. Uh, and we've developed uh, several tools to support our clients when they need it and support um, frontline staff uh, in providing access to our harm reduction uh, initiatives. So we've developed several uh, harm reduction initiatives um, throughout our hospital. Uh, first and foremost, a lot of these actually uh, started uh, way, way before um, COVID. So back in 2018, which seems like a lifetime ago, um, our outpatient program started uh, distributing naloxone, uh, as did our uh, emergency department. Um, in 2021, 20, uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we implemented our harm reduction philosophy as an organization, and we created a harm reduction committee. This committee has uh, individuals on it from um, uh, community-based organizations, uh, people with lived experience, and, and frontline staff members, and really provide us with the lens um, 
that uh, we really couldn't do without them. Uh, we were the first hospital in Ontario to start an inpatient naloxone distribution program. Um, so uh, anybody admitted to any of our inpatient environments uh, can have access to a naloxone kit um, prior to them being discharged from the hospital. Um, and we've been working very hard with public health on this initiative to ensure its success. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a minute. Uh, we have uh, crisis addiction uh, workers outreach, so our crisis workers actually go out into the community and also provide uh, harm reduction kits and, uh, and, um, and naloxone kits um, in our community. Uh, we are currently working on a naloxone administration medical directive. Uh, this will allow our staff in the hospital setting uh, to administer a naloxone while they're waiting for a, uh, a code blue team to arrive uh, if they suspect an overdose. And we've created several pre-printed order sets uh, that are um, available to any of our staff and physicians uh, throughout the hospital. One that I have not mentioned here because I just got an update today uh, is that we are also uh, in the, we also recently implemented a pilot, um, again, uh, collaborating with public health for harm reduction uh, injection kits that we are able to provide to our clients on our addictions medicine unit. Um, if it's successful, uh, if we get through the pilot phase, we're looking at how we can spread it hospital wide um, to our outpatient programs and utilizing our addictions medicine consult service uh, to support those in inpatient uh, settings as well. Focusing on uh, the inpatient naloxone distribution, um, once we received the go-ahead uh, to start implementing across the hospital, we took a staggered approach, uh, really focusing in on the units with the highest risk. Um, so we approached it in these four phases. First, we identified who had the highest risk, um, which units had, were ready to go, uh, and which ones need a little bit more time and contextual variables. We then uh, designed an education plan, a distribution a rollout plan, and developed a toolkit for the staff members, and we implemented in a waived approach. Um, keep in mind, this was uh, back at the start of 2021 when we were in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we had units in lockdown, we had uh, outbreaks everywhere, staff were burnt out uh, and struggling. And despite this fact, uh, most units welcomed this program with open arms to get uh, naloxone kits into people's hands before they leave the hospital and are arguably at one of the highest risks for overdose. Uh, it's been an extremely successful program. Uh, we, as, uh, we as a small team really took a grassroots approach. We made it as extremely easy as possible for people to take this and run with it. And uh, it has been uh, very successful. Um, so to date, our inpatient units um, have handed out 738 naloxone kits uh, in the 2021-2022 uh, fiscal year. And as of July this year, we've handed out another 446 kits. Um, which is a, a staggering amount of kits, uh, considering our population size that are out uh, in the community. Um, other successes that we've had, uh, we had our AMCS and AMU implemented. Um, we're piloting that harm reduction kit distribution, um, starting with injections um, and followed very closely by inhalation kits. Um, we are seeing a shift in culture within our hospital um, we are having people having conversations with individuals who would have avoided it in the past. Uh, we have complete uh, senior leadership buy-in that we are getting uh, support from VPs, directors, and our board of directors. And we have lots of community partners uh, that are jumping on board and supporting us when we are discharging from the hospital. In regards to lessons learned and next steps, um, again, uh, we couldn't have done this without our collaborative relationships and with our community partners. I think our collaboration with public health was essential in our naloxone distribution kit um, program. Uh, senior light leadership buy-in really did help uh, in uh, moving a lot of these programs forward, um, particularly developing a harm reduction philosophy and, and getting that in our strategic plan really allowed us to dedicate resources and time to these initiatives. Uh, we do have a very dedicated group of people uh, that uh, really have invested their time in, in developing a lot of these initiatives. 
Um, as for some lessons learned, these initiatives do take a lot of time. There's a lot of red tape in a hospital setting that we need to get through, um, but being persistent and, and, and working through those uh, things really does pay off, at least in our case. Uh, it, you need to pr prioritize those perceived and unperceived gaps and uh, feedback from staff and people with lived experience is essential um, when you're developing a lot of these initiatives. Uh, lastly, the work is never done. We are continuing to uh, try to move the needle forward and uh, ensure that uh, people within our communities are able to uh, get access to harm reduction uh, initiatives where possible and, um, and when possible. Uh, and that would be me. Perfect. Thank you, Michael, for such an inspiring presentation and understanding um, a true harm reduction approach at an acute care organization that it is possible, um, especially where you are. Um, I actually want to thank all of our panelists today on behalf of everyone here. Um, I hope you have really understood what it means to truly embrace harm reduction and to understand different programs of a philosophy of care and that it really can happen from, you know, community care to public health to, to acute care settings across across the spectrum so that no door really is the wrong door approach. One thing that I really did um, hear from all of our panelists today and I really wanted to echo it was understanding that there is a person, there's a person at the end of the day that's receiving care, that's receiving support, that, that, that our words are power and that we need to support the person behind behind the substance. Um, and so I, I really do want to echo that. And, I, and thank you for all of our participants and for your amazing and beautiful words that you shared with us. At this time, um, I would like to open up the lines for questions. If you feel comfortable, please unmute yourself and um, or raise your hand and we can call on you for any of our panelists today. Or if you want to type into the chat, I'll be absolutely pleased to read it out as well. So I have one question. Um, can you share one thing of importance when implementing a harm reduction approach? If I'm beginning in my journey in this, in this area, um, irrespective of where I work, what is one thing that you think is really important? I can jump in. Um, that this community has a lot of strengths. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that people who use drugs hold as a community. A lot of harm reduction has been driven by people who use drugs. Um, and we need to approach people humble about the knowledge that we don't have. Because what I unfortunately sometimes see is people who are like staff and healthcare workers who come forward and say, I have a harm reduction approach. Um, and it's just, there's a lot of blind spots in what you might not know that you don't know. So making sure that you're asking questions, being curious and being respectful um, and looking for knowledge from multiple sources, including from within the community itself, because people know their own experience. Thank you. Scott has his hand up. I, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll help you see the hands. Scott oh, has thank you. Physical hands. Sorry, yeah. And, and one thing, Michelle, you wanted, wanted to just touch on is uh, us as, as people with lived experience and living experience, we don't know either. We're, 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 we're grasping at straws because we're scared. We just want to get well. So, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I see um, that Galaxy S10 has their hand up. You can unmute your line, please, and, and ask your question. Hi, my name is Cindy Gagnon. I'm a registered nurse at um, one of the prisons, uh, federal prisons in Kingston, Ontario. Um, we're slated nationally to be one of the next sites to have what they're calling a overdose prevention site. Um, I was just wondering if any of the panelists have been approached at all in speaking with people in the Ontario Region Correctional Services of Canada. Um, I'm very glad that this presentation is being um, recorded and I hope to get the link for that because I showed it to my senior manager and they're like, oh, that would be so great. And I said, yes, because if we're gonna open a place like this, I feel like you need a very special kind of staff member to work there, but they also need all the training. So I was just listening out of interest, but also because I think it's something that 
Um, you know, I hear people saying we have to start treating the people as people, and there's no way to do that if we don't have the background in education. So um, I, I'm wondering if anyone has approached any of you folks that have organized this or spoke on the panel, because um, I think this would be really fabulous to do in the Kingston region, uh, or Ontario region, but the majority of our persons, as you know, are in Kingston. So that would be real helpful. It's an amazing comment. I think that we should be able to um, um, legitimify legitify the harm reduction world, make this accreditation, make it a harm reduction professional, bring them, uh, the education and, and all these things to the people that are, are giving you that information, make it an, a, 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 an exchange. You give us this information, we'll give you the accreditation. You'll be able to take that and use that as employment. So I think that that might be an option. Fantastic. Does any of our panelists have anything else to comment? Um, I can I can make a quick comment to, to answer your question. The first part of your question, I, ha I have not been approached uh, specifically me um, from uh, the corrections uh, organization. But um, in, in speaking with what you're saying, I do want to, uh, yes, uh, agree that the education um, is, is essential. So one of the, the biggest barriers that we're facing as an organization is stigma, bias, um, and, and just this, this culture uh, and approach uh, to clients who use substances. And, and that's, I mean, we, we have a lot of tools that we've developed and have been embraced as example, the naloxone program. Uh, however, the stigma, the culture is going to take a lot of time and uh, and a lot of effort and resources to change. So yes, uh, I 100% agree that you you need um, you need to spend the time providing training um, and and providing uh, experience and opportunities for individuals uh, in order to grow. Um, and recognize their own biases and stigma and, and then challenge those so that they can change. Um, it takes time, but it's possible. Thank you, Michael. Um, Hagar. If you can unmute your line. What about the uh, mental aspect of all this? Because, um, the root of all these problems is the mental, mental health, right? And I don't, I don't hear it, it. I don't. With all the presentations, I don't. I'm not hearing. What are we doing for these uh, clients with regards to their mental health? Yes, a few people mentioned social support, housing, and um, all the other measures, but. How, how are we, how is, how is mental health connecting with all these programs? Are they, are the, is the government providing support, mental health support for these clients? Is it done directly or indirectly? It's, it's very vague right now. Can, can someone answer that question? If, if, make it more clear, because I'm, I'm not, I'm not sort of, um, because I'm a registered nurse and I and a lot of these patients have a lot of mental health issues. That's why they're doing these, they get into these habits. And they Fantastic. don't seem to have the support. Fantastic. <laughs> Mish has her hand up to answer the question. And then Scott. Yeah, happy to jump in. The first thing I just want to say is that we need to remember that the majority of people who are using substances are not using in pathological ways. Um, so the majority of people use drugs for pleasure, euphoria, in ways that are not meeting the definition of a substance use disorder. So I think that's important to recognize, one, for stigma and when we're interacting with our clients. Um, though I do agree, a lot of people, when they do have problematic substance use, it often comes from a place of trauma um, and needing a coping mechanism. And unfortunately, we have so much work to do in having an accessible mental health care system. Um, luckily, with our program, we are connecting people um, you know, to primary care providers to address, you know, from a, from a medical perspective, um, for example, starting antipsychotics, uh, antidepressants, et cetera, getting psychiatry involved when needed, um, and having the ability to advocate for our clients when they are in contact with the healthcare system. Um, 
But beyond that, you know, for any population, it's very difficult to access mental health services in Ontario. Um, and even for clients that do wish to access other forms of uh, treatment and services, such as inpatient services, there really isn't much available, unfortunately, to connect them to, or there's very long wait lists and a lot of barriers. But um, I agree, we need to be looking at the root causes and what we can do with that. Fantastic. Thank you, Mish. Um, Scott, do you had something to add? I did. Um, just to keep going on that, is a lot of our, our people who use, uh, who use substances and who have a problematic um, substance use disorder are, be, have been stigmatized and, and, and um, victimized by the medical community. So they're afraid to engage to begin with. So once we have to get over that barrier first in order to make sure that they're comfortable and using uh, the services that are available in the, most, in the most effective way. Thanks, Scott. And then Michael, I think you had something to respond as well. Um, thank you, uh, Scott. That, that uh, is a very important point to, to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, support that is available um, to clients within uh, our communities and accessing healthcare. Uh, and I don't want to paint a picture that uh, sounds that everything is all, all good up here uh, in our area, but we are working very, very hard in, in developing um, clearer pathways for our clients in between our programs and developing no wrong door approaches. Um, and a lot of it has to do with resource investment. So um, mental health and addictions programs are, uh, are, are underfunded in general. Um, so it we have a lot of uh, opportunities for growth. Um, but what some of the things that we're doing here is trying to get people connected um, where they present. So emergency department, inpatient beds, addictions medicine units uh, to our outpatient programs. Um, and we're doing that through things like inReach. So um, I manage the RAM clinic here. We have our addictions navigator going into the hospital to provide intakes um, so that we are letting people leave with appointments. They don't need an appointment. They can just show up. Um, but uh, those are, are ways that we're trying to reduce barriers. Um, a lot of our uh, outpatient programs, um, at least in, in the substance use field, uh, don't have um, a, a referral necessary approach. So uh, a lot of self-referral can happen. Um, but getting people connected, uh, as Scott said very clearly, is the hardest part. Um, a lot of people have had very bad uh, and traumatic experiences with the healthcare system in general. Thanks, Michael. And I think Mish also made a really great comment in the chat that we need to make sure that mental health services are not abstinence based only, that it should happen across the care setting, across the continuum of substance use as well, right? And, Absolutely. and I think that's an amazing point to remember as well. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer. Sorry, I had to find my own button. Um, First off, I just wanted to uh, address what Hagar had said, um, but I agree with the fact that we sometimes, like we often don't hear about what we're doing to help those who are, um, who do have a substance uh, use disorder, but also have a comorbidity of a mental health uh, diagnosis or, or maybe no diagnosis at all, just like a history of trauma or a need to use crystal meth just to be able to stay awake and safe on the street. Uh, different, different reasons why people uh, are using. And um, I just wanted to highlight for everyone, if you're not aware of us, I work for a Christian charity called Indwell. We just uh, opened our, or we, we just hit our 1,000 people uh, housed marker, and I'm working at Embassy Commons in London, and um, we are moving in two folks a day. I used to work at London Intercommunity Health Centre in the health outreach side, and the Safe Opiate Supply Program was run out of there. And... I'm seeing now some of my patients from there moving in with us here at Indwell, where we're meeting them where they're at, where we're, I was playing my ukulele and singing with, uh, with folks the other day and, and eating with people and, and running programs. And we have, we have addiction support and housing support and nursing and psychosocial and, and uh, real wraparound 
care here and then really work to build uh, community um, with folks. And um, I just, I'm seeing a lot of my same fellow, like men and women that, uh, that I knew in the Safe Supply Program who are being moved into beautiful furnished apartments or being able to eat, um, you know, like a health, healthy meal and be supported. So I just wanted to tell Hagar that I agree that if you don't have those wraparound services available to build relationships and supports and community, even like not even, but amongst uh, themselves too, where they can build safe community and explore their gifts and talents and, and have some time to heal. Maybe they will never choose to uh, stop using substances, but they will be able to do so in a, in a safer uh, way. And also, if they do decide to stop using substances, they'll be in a place where, where they have that time to even think about it, you know, where they're able to be away from people who are, are um, they're pre like predators for them and where they are not worrying about their next like meal or next fix or whatever. So it's a tricky thing, um, but at least some, some things are moving forward. And I'm really proud to be part of Indwell here and excited to see what we're doing. Thank you, Jennifer. If you can put the link in the chat, that would be phenomenal. Um, I think it's really important what you're saying and really understanding, you know, the basic needs that people have, but understanding again, Scott, like you said, is there's a person, right? And and how do we support the person at, at, at with the basic fundamental needs of life and, and and inclusion and belonging and support, right? That's amazing. Thank you. There is, um, Jordan had a really great question in the chat. Um, what are the panelists' favorite parts about working in harm reduction? What helps you sustain your energy and your activism? Any of the panelists can unmute their line. Um, I'll unmute. Um, oh, sorry. No, it's, it's okay. just it's you go. the everyday human connections. Um, and I think in a lot of previous nursing, I sort of felt a need to be a certain person and to sort of suppress my, my personality and humor. And it's really exciting to be able to bring your whole self to work and really connect with people and give them a new experience of healthcare. Um, and I think that's what I mean when I say like transformative health programs, you can really see just the difference that treating someone with respect and like a human um, is unfortunately a novel experience in our healthcare system for some people. Um, so it's really great to see people develop trusting relationships with a healthcare provider. It's very rewarding. Haley. I know for, my, I know for oh, myself, um, um, I know for myself when I was um, in my, uh, in, in, in the, um, the heaviness of my addiction, uh, living in Toronto, uh, I felt, Alone. I felt absent and invisible and I'm not going to be that person I'm going to make sure that I make everyone that I touch feel important Jordan did plenty of that question on purpose <laughs> beautiful response Scott thank you Haley did you have something to comment um, yeah, I, I put my response in the chat, but happy to say it as well for people who can access the chat. Yeah, um, just I think uh, hearing from service users and community members about how drug checking results help them advocate for themselves, whether it's with their primary care provider or their team, um, helps them communicate with their friends what's in their local supply, because often we know that, you know, uh, uh, drug markets are very hyper localized. So what one people what one person is using is often what other people will be using as well. So helping to sort of spread the word that way in terms of what's in the drug supply things people want to uh, avoid or not. 
And then again, what I mentioned in the presentation, just around bringing that information back to people being able to bring that information back to their seller and say like, you know, whatever, wherever you're getting your product, it is a good product for, for me at least, or there's less contaminants in it, or, you know, there's really a lot of contaminants in this product that people do not want to be using. Um, and I heard a very heartwarming story on Friday that uh, during the height of the pandemic, somebody was able to use our results to avoid using fentanyl that was contaminated with benzene. Benzos. They felt very strongly that they did not want to be consuming benzos, and it was through our results that they were able to ensure that they weren't. Um, and yeah, that was a really heartwarming story. It's great to hear, Harley. Haley. Sometimes the the work that you do and not seeing the impacts makes a difference, but when you hear these kind of stories, they really they validate, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's a question from Jean. Um, why, when someone is admitted to the hospital, does the doctor keep the patient long enough to appear sober and then, like a revolving door, discharge the patient back into the mess that they were admitted from? Should this not be seen as negligence? You got a comment, Scott? A little too quick to comment there. Um, uh, <laughs> That's um, okay. Uh, I... I that is a touchy subject because um, th there's a clinic, there's a clinical um, aspect of what uh, a doctor will do with the, with the patient and they and they have the, their um, checklists and things they need to go through. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's been times where you question, how did they get out of the hospital? And, and yeah, there's been some questions and I don't know if it's a, uh, if, it, if it's a stigma thing or if it's a, 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 a this is the way it's always been done you know get it, pull up your bootstraps to get going um kind of thing or or is it just um uh, they're too busy or they're too overworked so i think this is the place where we see the importance of acute care michael like sort of the, the work that you're doing at Sudbury health sciences north that's so revolutionary i think in in, in the world of harm reduction uh, mish i see your hand oh sorry go ahead michael um and I, I mean, it's it. There, there's systems in place, and there is, is culture and and longstanding um, approaches to to the treatment of individuals who use substances uh, that has existed for a very long time. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, I did indicate that um, I've seen system transformation in our hospital. And I, I do believe we have a very long way to go. Um, but even things like our addictions medicine consult service, where we're providing people with access to addictions specialists uh, when they arrive at the hospital and are able to help them help treat the withdrawal so that they don't leave against medical advice um, immediately, as soon as possible when they're coming through the door, things like that. Um, advocating with uh, units um, to ensure that they get an appropriate length of stay, um, that they're admitted if they need to be admitted. Um, having our addictions medicine unit where individuals can go, um, where we have, uh, they'll be treated for their medical concern or their psychiatric concern um, when they're stabilized, um, but we'll also provide them with support for housing and, um, and you know, um, if they want to receive treatment uh, for their substance use, we'll receive treatment for their substance use there. If they don't, that's okay too. Um, these things take time, um, and I can't emphasize the need for buy-in from senior leadership for these things to really move forward. Um, so making that change in an organization like a hospital is essential. Absolutely, and the um, it, it brings it back to the uh, what I think is like the engaging clients use best practice guidelines. One of our main um, organizational philosophies was embracing a harm reduction approach from the from the top down, for lack of better words, right? And, and how that can make such an impact on the person um, who's receiving care. Um, Amber, I see your hand is up if you want to ask your question. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, I have a question from the chat. Uh, what is something we can do in our practice that shows folks that use substances that we are a safe place and practice harm reduction approaches? Great question. I think I said it in my talk, that the easiest, most effective way you can uh, show people that you care and you are, you are using a harm reduction approach 
Those are your words. Is using the, the, the proper terminology. Um, you're, they're not, uh, um, you're, you're not clean. You know, you know, how long have you been clean? No, I showered this morning. Thank you very much. You know, so, um, and, and things like that. Um, it's, it's, as soon as someone says those words to me, it just, I flip a switch and I don't pay attention. And it just made your job 10 times harder. Thanks, Scott. Does any of our other panelists have any comments? So I would just, I just wanted to say what uh, um, Scott was trying to, my, my original question is exactly what, try, what Scott is trying to say is that I think maybe we, we as, as nurses, this is part of our program anyway, but we, we need to have a sort of program for doctors and, and nurses and all the healthcare professionals where we can, we can um, have a, uh, a counseling sort of counseling education, psychosocial counseling, so we can know how to communicate with our patients to, to, to treat them with care as an individual because there's obviously a lack of resources. That's why the mental health funding is not there in our systems. So if we put it as part of our curriculum and how to communicate with patients with care, true care and treat them as individuals, I think all these issues will go away like the stigma and, and all the other issues that we've discussed today. Um, is that something that's already been started? Is this something that's on a discussion? Has any, does, does any of the associations bring up these issues? Because there's only so many counselors out there, there's so many psychologists out there. We need more people to, to get involved, more healthcare professionals to get involved in systems like this where we can treat them like individuals. Because I've seen it before how some of these, um, Patients are treated. Absolutely. Can anyone make, make a comment on that? I, I don't know. I, I don't work in those areas, but. Does any of our panelists have comments for Hager's question or statement? It's not necessarily a perspective from Toronto's drug checking service, but as an employee of maybe St. Michael's Hospital and Unity Health Toronto, and just hearing about the work that Michael is doing. Um, I, I do think like these big hospital systems uh, putting for like, you know, making harm reduction a part of their um, strategic plan for the next four years, like genuinely integrating it into everything that they do does make a big change or can make a big impact. And um, I'm hoping, I know in, in Toronto's downtown core, uh, a lot more hospitals are moving towards that. And I would like to see it go um, systems wide um, because I, I think, you know, organizations like that do have to um, follow through with their key performance indicators or what is in their strategic plan and, and making yourself accountable to them is really impactful or can be really impactful. I think what Mish said in the chat in regards, it starts from when nurses are being trained or when healthcare providers are being trained, right? Integrating harm reduction into a basic part of healthcare training, um, not a one day course or not a one day add on where someone comes in to teach a half an hour or an hour session on it, but actually in truly, truly integrating the principles into undergrad education and then ensuring that no door is the wrong door, right? Like harm reduction belongs not only in community care, not only in public health, but it does belong everywhere where a client can access care. And, and as some of our panelists have shown in a medical and a non-medical model as well too, and really um, in encouraging that. Um, there's one final question, Matthew, I'm gonna let you open your lines, but uh, I, I am re recognizing you're almost at time. So go ahead, Matthew. I actually just wanted to quickly speak to um, uh, the issue around communication. Um, so, if uh, I do see if there is another question, so I can just send, I can let them go ahead. No, go ahead, Matthew. It's okay. So, um, Daniel Kahneman in his book Noise kind of describes how the environment impacts our ability to make decisions. 
So even though we're taught a specific certain way as a nurse, um, uh, as soon as we're on a unit, we're short staffed, we're burnt out. Um, there's poor, it, it's just a chaotic environment to be in. And so clients um, uh, who use substances quite often, we don't communicate our what we're capable to provide to them. And this is an instance with almost any clients that we might actually be coming into um, uh, contact with, which can potentially lead to a misinterpretation of um, uh, meaning by the nurse. So it's important to or to, to discuss what it is that you can provide as a nurse, how you can help set those, let them know right at the gate, provide boundaries, inc enhance communication, um, because it's very easy for things to get lost in the noise and for us to quickly write someone off as being um, uh, a difficult and having them leave against medical advice. I say that in quotation marks, but you can't really see that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to quickly um, uh, emphasize the importance of that communication and communicating our capacity as nurses. Matthew, um, I'm going to open it up to any of our panelists that have any final comments or any inspirational words of wisdom to any of our uh, participants. Yeah, just, um, you know, nurses have a voice and have the ability to make changes in our healthcare system. And I'm glad to see over 100 uh, participants here today interested in learning about harm reduction um, and just try and have a voice and speak up for people who, unfortunately, uh, their voices aren't often heard in our healthcare system. So thank you. Thank you. Any of our, uh, any of our other panelists? Um. I think uh, it's hard, hard to follow that one, but uh, uh, I think, you know, I think we're at a, a very important point uh, right now um, in, in harm reduction. Um, there's a lot of focus going on substance use uh, and the opioid crisis. Uh, and I think now is a good time to act, um, act with uh, advocacy, uh, really push the, push the agenda forward and really advocate for more, um, more support uh, and, and really continue to advocate within your hospital setting uh, and in your work environment, because I do think that we can make change uh, and nurses do have a very loud voice. Uh, most of the frontline uh, staff that I did mention are nursing staff that are providing our harm reduction um, support through in our, throughout our hospital. So I don't know if that made lots of logical sense, but I, there you go. I threw it out there. I sure did. Thank you, Michael. Any final comments? Hearing none, I really wanna thank everyone for being a part of um, our discussion and, and sticking around right to the end. I really do appreciate it. It's been an incredible conversation and there have been some more questions coming in. So um, I will, uh, honor the chat and take a look at it and, and get those questions answered for sure. Um, if you would like to be involved with any of our program offerings, um, including future webinars, our contact information is on the screen. We'd love to hear from you and see you. And we have quite exciting um, events planned coming up in the near future. I will uh, turn it over to Susan to do some final remarks in our closing. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Well, uh, the panel was just fabulous. Um, you brought through so many different perspectives and I think made all of us think, um, learn some new things and probably think in some different ways and maybe even reflect on our practices ourselves as, as nurses. So um, this was a, a wonderful uh, you know, addition and complimentary um, webinar to the last one. So if you didn't see the last one, uh, we welcome and encourage you to watch that one. And then this one, I think we will um, post um, most, if not all of it online for you to see and, and review as well. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, you gave your time to us and your expertise and your wisdom and, uh, and to Sabrina and Matt and other team members who put together this fabulous panel. Uh, so we'll see you again, um, possibly in a month, uh, if you choose to join the next 
health system um, transformation webinar. And we'll uh, just uh, keep an eye on our events page for more details about that. That will be held on December 12th. And then after that, we'll be in the new year. So thank you everyone so much. We hope that you enjoyed today and uh, that you've got lots of great pieces of wisdom to take with you.